begin with taking the paying homage to the Buddha, taking the three refuges and the five precepts as a basis for our practice. So you can just chant along with me. And, the, and in case you're new to this, um, the part is Pali language, and the first three lines are saying, homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Pay homage to the Buddha who gave these beautiful teachings, liberating teachings. And then uh, taking refuge in the Buddha, the, the quality of awakeness, the, the possibility to awaken. Uh, taking refuge in the Dhamma, the truth of the way things are, and also the, the map that the Buddha left for us, the Dhamma teachings, and refuge in the Sangha, the community, past, present and future, taking refuge in those who practice well, practice with integrity, those who gain insight on the path. So taking refuge in community and in that within each of us, which has the aspiration and the intention and the uh, stepping up to practice, to realize the truth of the way things are. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Bhutang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sankhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi bhutang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi tamang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sankhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi bhutang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi tamang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sankhang saranang gachami. And then the five precepts. So I'll chant in Pali and you can join me if you know the Pali and then we'll say the English. Panati pata veramani si kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precepts to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adinna dana veramani si kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precepts to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara veramani si kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precepts to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musavada veramani si kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precepts to refrain from false and harmful speech. Sura mereya manjapamadatana veramani si kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precepts to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha si kapadani silena sukha tinyanti silena goga sampada silena nimutinyanti tasma silang visotaye. These are the five precepts. Sila or ethics, morality, uh, are a source of true happiness. Sila, ethics, morality is a source of true wealth. Sila, ethics, morality is a source, is a support for the peacefulness that leads to liberation. 
So take good care of your sila. Thank you, Mel. <clears throat> so just just give me one second, please. Leave you, leave you with the Buddha for a moment. So finding your posture for meditation, your physical posture, find a, a seat, way of sitting where you can feel the support of the seat beneath you, the ground beneath you, that your body's supported to be Uh, upright if you're able to sit upright but whether you're sitting or laying down you know some you may have a need to lay the body down either way to have a posture that encourages a sense of alertness a sense of awakeness having a stable foundation beneath you, allowing yourself to fully sit, fully rest into your seat. To fully arrive here, right here. Taking some deep breaths, allowing the body to receive the breath fully and let it go. I'm just inviting your attention to come down from the, the thinking mind, from your head. Down into the chest and into the belly. If you're sitting on a chair, maybe into your feet. Watching into the experience of sitting here, how it feels, of being here. Being aware of the breath, entering your lungs, your chest, the rib cage, opening and relaxing with each in breath and each out breath. Resting into this stable foundation beneath you. Being aware of the spaciousness above and around you. It connects you with the breath or with which the breath connects you. And coming into your heart center. If it's helpful, you can touch your heart center. I'm just seeing what you find here is your heart center. It's, it's the heart. It's steady, settled, 
Is it trembling? Is it closed or open or peeping open a little bit, a little peek? Just knowing how it is for you right now. With each in-breath, just being aware of how the breath expands the chest area, it makes space around the heart area. You could even invite it to make space within the heart. There's no forcing, there are no demands. Just an invitation to open up a little room here in and around the heart. If anything feels like it gets in the way of that, just bring your attention to that. Oh, what's this? What's this that doesn't want that? Very natural, wholesome, furthering experience to happen. You may find you get a bit of a mix. So partly the heart's opening and partly there's some holding back. So if that's the case, just take care of inviting that opening to continue with each breath. As you practice in this way, keep making that invitation for an expansiveness, for an opening, a letting go, a radiating. It starts at the heart center and opens up in all directions, all around us, above and below, so that it's opening like a like a sphere, like a globe, but not a fixed globe, rather perhaps like a ball of light. It's not limited by anything. That light can radiate through every cell of your body. It can bring light to even the darkest corners of your mind. All you have to do is to tend that light. Tend it and invite it to spread. With no sense of limits or restrictions. Just letting it spread as far as it wants to go. It's 
So with each in-breath, we bring a little more attention to that brightness, that light. And the attention feeds it, nourishes it. And with each out-breath, we let go. Letting go of any ideas of lack or limitation. Letting go of any obstructions that you may find. So that the light isn't hindered by these. It can continue its journey outwards through Noticing if any stories come up in the mind as to why I can't possibly do this. Just noting them and coming back to your heart center. To inviting this radiant quality. It's natural quality. Tending to this quality with each in-breath and each out-breath. Relaxing into it. Allowing.
Noticing whether there's any, whether there are any obstructions or contractions. Seeing if you can relax around them, invite them to open up. This radiant quality isn't obstructed by body or floor or ground, earth, objects. It just radiates in all directions, spacious. It's all embracing.
So we come towards the end of this meditation. Be aware of your body in contact with the seat or the ground. Being aware of the movement of your chest with each breath. So you might want to take a minute to stretch, a couple of minutes, please do so. Excuse me that I didn't bring a, a nice glass, I'm drinking from a jar here. <clears throat> so, so I wanted to talk a little bit today about the importance of, um, of, of spaciousness, of opening, of uh, allowing uh, a different mode to our usual mode in the spiritual path. So generally many of us start the practice through a sense of feeling the dukkha, feeling the, the um, difficulty of, of, of being a human being, of being a separate person, or they may, or we may have um, experienced an unexpected death or you know somebody close to us who's died and then it kind of shocks us into thinking a little differently about our lives or occasionally you know people have a, an unusual sort of mystical experience and then they they want to look more closely you know what's what's going on here what is this about so whatever it is um you know there's a there's an it's kind of a leading into wanting to understand more deeply this spirit, this human life and the purpose of this human life. And it can, we can start our practice with a sense of um, me, you know, on a spiritual path who's trying to, or not even not on a spiritual path, just trying to get some more well-being and some healing and get out of some bad habits that are, taking us in the wrong direction and, and uh, let's get more well and more uh, aligned so it can begin that way and from that place you know we can put in we often need to put in quite a bit of effort and intention and uh, and practice you know like with a certain steadiness and certain intention and, and find whatever it is that supports that often it's sangha often it's a other people you know, who are like-minded who are also wanted to practice together and this is really important you know this is this is kind of how it begins uh, that we have this intention and energy behind that intention that that leads us into the practice and you know we can be evaluating our practice how am i doing <clears throat> How is that meditation? How is, you know, how is my sila? How am I managing with the presets? 
you know this is these are important ways things to check in you know, how how are we doing and the the path does invite us into a, a greater experience so you now when we're meditating if the meditation is all about me doing something in order to get something then it remains quite limited it remains rather small and the nature of meditation is that it allows us to in a way relax out of our usual habitual way of thinking and and behaving actually so by by sitting still by by stilling the body and inviting the mind to settle on an object that's different you know there's not scrolling you know getting stimulated by lots of different things that we see online or it's not going out to get entertained or and it's and it may be obsessing you know it may be that when we sit and meditate the mind carries on obsessing for some time but even that, you know, probably if you keep coming back to the cushion, it's not going to go on forever. Otherwise, you're just going to give up, probably. There's probably at least a moment here and there where that settles down. Um, and so the meditation invites this uh, different way of being. It, it goes against the way of the personality. <clears throat> probably many of us, you know, if we were, if we were, told when we were say 15 you know that we'd be sitting in meditation uh on on zoom we would probably think nah i don't think so you know and yet there's something that's called us to this path so the so the meditation practice it invites this alternate way of being that isn't ego based it isn't uh personality based it doesn't require us to have a phd or to um, be neurotypical it doesn't require us uh, to be in any way perfect thankfully it's um it just requires us to have a have some faith a bit of trust and some presence you know, bringing bringing awareness to what's going on and a little curiosity or an inquiry and a, a sense of staying with staying with our experience and allowing for something different to happen so if we're very much on a program okay i'm doing this in order to get that and i want to get i've heard about these states and i want to get those things going so if we're operating from a sense of somebody trying to get something, we're going to stay pretty stuck and maybe get quite frustrated. And having said that, it is helpful. It can be helpful to have a, you know, a map and a sense of direction. But it's more a sense of direction where we're, you know, we're aware where we are right now, where we're sounds a little con contrary to what I was saying before, but we're, we're, we're here present with what's happening here and now. And we're relaxing and opening and allowing and unfolding to happen. So when there's a, a greater spaciousness and a certain letting go of the story of self and of the somewhat contracted experience of the body and uh, you know, the mind moves out of the old habitual patterns and tendencies and it allows for something unusual to happen and it allows for a quite quite different perspective to open up so in the meditation that i was just guiding it was a kind of a meta meditation but it was you know, it's more like light and spaciousness, and like spacious awareness. So we're staying, we're staying centered. We're staying present. We're staying with the breath, but we're not staying within the the limitations of the body, and we're not staying within the limitations of of the thinking mind. 
So we're opening up a, a greater, more expansive awareness. And in that more expansive awareness, the, the personality, the sense of who and what I am, doesn't really have a place. This is kind of irrelevant. It might still pop up and try and assert itself, but it, it is actually kind of irrelevant. And um, so in those in that meditation, we're strengthening the natural quality of awareness. It's, it's an impersonal quality. It's kind of a universal quality or a shared quality. We're strengthening that awareness and we're um, turning away from the story, the small story of me and mine. So even if it's just for that short time, we're nourishing what is greater, what is far greater than ourselves. And in doing that, we open a possibility to, to see more clearly, to see a greater truth than, than our thinking mind can ever come up with, than our personality could ever imagine. So we give invitation in this slowing down and settling and opening and inviting that opening to just keep keep opening limitlessly. We're not putting limits on it. In that we are making space for, in a way for an untangling of the self. There's room for it to sort of start to undo and for a, a greater reality than the, the sense of self, the sense of me and mine. So the, the Brahma Viharas, the four boundless qualities, they, they invite this to happen. It's not about me being a kind person, having met the, although that does happen as we practice those Brahma Viharas, it does transform us. It does transform the heart, but it's not about trying to become anything. It's more inviting a quality that's more like a universal quality to arise in the heart, mind, heart, mind, and then strengthening that universal quality. And it's likewise with the awareness, with just the, the light of awareness. I like to practice in that way, with the, you know, thinking, experiencing awareness as a spaciousness and, a, and a, a lightness, a radiance that's not limited by anything. And just letting it, letting it spread out in all directions. And letting the sense of self be, you know, letting, letting the mind have a rest from that tedious sense, small sense of self. <laughs> it has a rest, it can, it can rest into a more spacious, awareness. So in, in when we're doing that, we are strengthening in a way the spiritual qualities which are impersonal. They're, or you could say they're beyond personal. They're experienced here personally, we each experience them individually. And the Dhamma is to be in, ex, understood individually by the wise, we have to know it for ourselves. So it's experienced here these qualities are experienced here, but they're not personal qualities. They're more like universal qualities. So in this uh, practice, you know, one of the ways the practice develops is that we, as we get out of the way more and more, you know, truth and benevolence and clarity and insight are able to live through us or flow through us or be expressed through us and it's not that we then get hold of it of those qualities and say i've got this and i've got that it's more we recognize when we get out of the way step aside these qualities can start to shine through so i wanted to offer that today and i'd like to open up to any questions or comments that anyone have or has on that 
topic, uh, whether it makes sense to you, whether it sounds like double dutch, please, uh, please um, speak up. Does it does it resonate in any way? Yes, please. Karina, yes. Um, do I have to okay, yeah. Mm. Sorry, I'm not sure I have to do that now. Let me see. Mm. I don't think I have uh, I, I don't have the uh, I, I'm not able to ask her to unmute, so Oh, it worked. There we are. Good. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. First it said you can't unmute, and now I can. Great. Great. There's a teaching in itself there. <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for that reflection. Um, why is it that it's always just what I need to hear, <laughs> whatever is being said? <laughs> um, yeah, I resonated with it very much. Uh, uh, there are a couple, definitely a couple phrases. I mean, just just the whole concept of I've been feeling how I can get so twisted in my personality, um, and just being able to to tune into another, into a a, a greater reality. Uh, um, yeah, and it's it's nice to. To find that in the meditation and to, and, and to remind myself, you know, I'm not coming from a sense of self and like, okay, I'm trying to get this or do that. It's such a different way of being um, that I, I, you know, I need a lot of reminders. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to being able to tune into that kind of perception even when I'm not in meditation. Um, and especially when I get twisted up. <laughs> uh, you know, on a, on a loop of something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's very important what you said because you know, like, there's the the tendency that's the, the sense of self is a contraction. That's what it is. So that any kind of personality, even like big expensive personalities, are still, you know, in ultimate standards, small <laughs> and kind of really contracted. Because they're conditioned, and uh, so part of what uh, part of the process is actually shifting, uh, really consciously, shifting from like experiencing maybe this more spacious meditation, and and then maybe you come out of that, and you're in your still spacious for a while, and then something happens that you know you get stuck back into that small. So to to stay with that, so not to think like. Oh, that's this bad thing. I've got to get rid of it. But more like, oh, and now I'm in this funny knot again. Oh, yeah. What's that like? You know, and to and to be with that and see what, how does that, how does the mind, how do you show up? You know, how does how does that work when you're in that knot? And then it's you know it's painful, it's limited, it's it's awkward, and in all of those things. And and then it's so just knowing that, and not trying to kind of bash it away or push it, you know, a bit more like, oh, there's that, oh yeah, that's that kind of dukkha state of being a, a small person. And then when conditions allow to make some space around that, you might not be able to immediately, because often it's triggered by, you know, a situation you're in, and then it's, you're just sort of caught for a while. But then as soon as there's an opportunity, whatever that might be, whatever that might look like, it's, it'll be different for different people at different times making some space around that tight knot and then taking a breath so it's making some space inside also and just inviting like oh, can that loosen a little bit how is that if it loosens a bit and but not to um well to, to kind of get familiar with the shift you know with the movement from the more spacious and open and pleasant into the small and contracted and then it, back into the more spacious again and then that's going to happen again and and it may happen in different ways in different there may be different different ways that 
different kinds of knots, you know, <laughs> depending on what's going on. And then just getting familiar with the shift between the between the spacious and open and sort of impersonal and the caught in a in a, in a self. So that's very helpful to, to get comfortable with that movement between the two. And then you know, over time, then there's as you do that, then the, the awareness gets more open around all of it. It's not so invested in anything. So it's like, oh, there's that tight thing again. Oh yeah, I know that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like, well, then it can kind of welcome it. Like, oh, yeah, hello, I'm familiar with you. I know where those, I know the way that not, you know. And um, the, the, the awareness itself will start to loosen it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for that reminder to to focus on the shift um, and the back and forth, um, which 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 I need uh, more back and forth <laughs> or more uh, more frequency in between the two. And, um, how how important? Um, yeah, just see the see the meditation practice for me can can be is. Uh, to help reconnect me to that. I mean, there are other times when I can feel it, but yeah. Right. And there may be other situations that you may find like, um, I don't know, having a bath or being in nature or something. And there may be other situations where you realize like, oh, yeah, there's some spaciousness because I don't have to show, I don't have to be anyone, you know. The program doesn't have to be running now. You know, that you might find there are other times. And then just to notice them, just noticing is, is important. Appreciate them. Thank you. Yes. Sylvia. Can you hear me? I can hear you a little bit quiet, but I can hear you. Okay, so I'm going to go closer. Much that's better. great. Wow, that's much better. <laughs> Just getting closer, it's it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to talk about a very personal experience that's happening right now to me. And uh, I'm going to try to be the shortest possible. So nobody gets very bored about my talking. Um, two years ago, when all the pandemia started, uh, I created a group of seven women. Some are in Mexico, some are in different places in the US. And so we were eight or nine women all, always, every Monday. And, and it worked, worked beautifully. I don't know what happened uh, lately, there are some people who have developed the desire to be on top <laughs> of the group, which is so common. I don't know if between women or also with men or what kind of people. I'm one of them. <laughs> I cannot say I'm different because I don't want to live it like this. I mean, it has worked the two years beautifully. But also, I was almost going to say, to tell everybody that I was going to leave my place for whoever wanted it. But then after I, I said that, it happened. I, I started to see how like the tigers came for the food. And then I got angry. <laughs> I haven't got too angry. I am still in my mind and in my heart. Um, but the thing is, I don't like that part of the humankind. I don't like it in them and I don't like it in me. It is like if we were lions or tigers and we are hungry and we, we suddenly forget 
that we love each other, that we still love each other, that we respect each other, that we enjoy the reunions every week. So I'm trying to be the wise person that I would like to be, which I'm not, but I would like to be like saying, okay, I'm retiring of my place. You know, my place is only to say, it's you, it, now, now you, now you. It's not like, oh, it's not like a big place. It, it, it's, it's more like putting order and, 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 and also the team. When I see that people are interested in something, I, I put it in the front. And uh, it, it's interesting because may, mainly the person who is now like doing all her work is my very first cousin. She's twice a cousin. Her mother and my mother were sisters. Her father and my father were brothers. And uh, we have the same blood. We have the same mind. We are... Uh, we are not ready to give up. We are fighters. We are Ukrainians, all of them. So uh, I'm all the time. It, it's it happened last week. I, I saw like the change. I saw this change, like my cousin taking the word, the microphone, and she doing the, the whole shtick. I didn't completely allow it. I kind of, you know, uh, we're not there yet. It's not like you can wipe me out. I'm ready to give it up, but not if you wipe me up. So, it's a contradiction because I don't know how honest I am. I don't know. I want to give away. My place is nothing. It's only you talk, you talk. <laughs> so I don't want to take too much time more than that. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's very interesting. I mean, I so you, your your role is you were saying that part of your role was holding order in the group you know and, and you initiated the group is that right yes yes and then you were holding order and now you've made an ex you've you've let people know that you don't want to keep that role is that did you let I, I i kind of already told them yeah but also uh at the same very same time i i saw that happening so I don't know if I want I wanted to say bye of my place or I was a little bit pushed. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't want to fight. Right. So um I think the sense of order is probably important in, in the group. And uh, that needs to be maintained in some way. So so there are two things. One is one is the group that needs to be taken care of. And um so maybe there are certain um, like community agreements, something like that, that you can come to together, the, the values that everybody shares that you just simple, a few simple things that you keep so that the, the group has some sense of order because you don't want it just like anyone grabs the mic and can do what they like. And that doesn't sound like a good system. And probably there's a bit of a sense of identification, you know, with the you know, I established the group and it's my group and I don't have a very big role, but it is actually a big role. You know, you're, you're the founder and then you're the guide. And so it's not big and yet it is big, you know, at the same time. And so if you're handing that over, what for whatever reason, I would really, it sounds like it's already in process and probably, you know, the group isn't, you know, if there's, if there's interest in the practice, then the group will continue so my, my recommendation to you would be stay in the group and feel what it feels like. Be with the feeling of being in the group and not being the, the, the important one. 
it's, it's a kind of a death in a way of, of to be there and, and particularly like even your cousin is is the one who's picking you know it's like ah you know it's like sibling rivalry isn't it and so just to be with the feeling that that brings up it might be very very strong feelings but to be with those feelings and not to act them out but to be curious about them to be interested in them because there's some sense of of um, ownership there that is probably causing that that uh, fight experience to come up in you and you know the the strength that you speak about as a ukrainian is a, a very beautiful and and valuable strength and then knowing how to use that and how and when to use that because there's times for it as we know and this probably isn't one of those times so if if you were if you were clear that this is your group and you're the leader and you're going to continue that way then then you could you know clearly just assert no my cousin you know you this is my group and i'm leading it this way and if you want to start a group that's okay but this is we're doing it like this but it sounds like you're actually for whatever reason you're willing to let go of your role part of you is willing part of you is willing and part of you is going no it's mine so that's the small part that's the contraction and so I, I would really encourage to pick it up as a practice and just to see like how is it to to be there and not be in that important role and you might feel a real sense of like um it can make a person feel uh, diminished or uh, irrelevant you know you, you might have the, these feelings of of being a sort of nothing you know and and so if that arises i would really encourage you to sit with that quietly you know don't don't have to discuss it with anyone but just to sit with those feelings and and tend to them with great care because those feelings they're they're like um you know when we when we when we hold on to things that are not really truly what we are not our true true nature positions and titles and whatever and outfits or whatever it might be you know hairstyles or whatever you know we hold on to these things that are not truly what we are and then when we lose them then we feel like we're losing part of ourselves. so your value lies in something deeper than than that position so it's it's like finding like allowing yourself to feel the sense of loss which could be big you know it can be a big a big feeling because it can be connected with other stories from the past other conditioning from the past and then touch into your true value what is what is truly of value to you because you started that meditation group because something was truly of value to you in in meditation practice and the spiritual path and that's beyond the, you know, you and your cousin and even, even national identity, you know, it's beyond all of that. Does that make sense? Very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. I really wish you well. Yeah. I think we have time for one more, one short one. Marnie? No? Okay. I would like to hear. Oh, yeah. Can I go? Oh, sorry. Bridget, yes. Hi. Is it okay? And was someone else, maybe someone else was trying to go? I'm not sure. Okay. Kedwin, do you mind waiting this time? I don't mind. And I'll say that mine is super quick too. So if there's time at the end. Did we, oh, sorry. I, I didn't know the protocol here if we were supposed to raise our hands or not. I saw that Caridwin and I raised our hands at the I same time. hands, okay. Anyway, let's, we've got three. <laughs> it's okay, um, I, can, I can wait too. Can we go a little bit over that. time? Would that be all right or not? No? What? I was just asking, he's frozen now. Okay, let's just go ahead. So Bridget actually first. Okay, thank you. And this this can be super brief. I just wanted to just uh, I just very much appreciated the teaching today and what you shared. Um, 
also particularly about the sense of self being a contracted place. Um, and I want to share too that in the meditation when we were sitting in silence, I kept um, having this experience of a lot of light kind of being broadcast in my body. And it was just a very, um, like I kept feeling like we just kind of have this, um, I don't know, maybe the question was like, I'm here to do what, like I'm this, I don't know, it was just the little, I, I, there weren't words actually, but it was like, almost like, what is my sense of, like, I don't know who am I in this, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> in this life that I'm receiving, you know, and I don't really, I'm not sure again, much more to say about that, except for that it was a different sensation. And it, when you were talking about these different kinds of awareness, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe that's, I was feeling a little bit of that where it's not me, you know, it's bigger than me. And I just, oh, it was like a relief. <laughs> it was like a relief in a way, like, oh. And so I'm just very grateful for that. So thank, thank you for the teaching. Thank you. And I think that's really important, that sense of relief. It is such a sense of relief, it's such a relief when we're not coming from the me and, it, and we do it so much that we don't know that there's anything else. And then suddenly like, oh, thank goodness. And it, we don't have to understand the, the light and the spaciousness. You just, just invite it and, and dwell in it and let it do whatever it needs to do. You know, it doesn't have to be understood intellectually. So, Caitlin. Uh Thank you. I, uh, I was thinking that um, when you were doing the guided meditation, that um, I, I love your guided meditations. There's this um, feeling of expansiveness um, for me uh, that I don't often experience like in my own meditation as much, or it takes longer. Um, but I was thinking about the contracted mind and how the contracted mind seems to lead to more contracted mind like you know it's like once your mind is contracted like it's really easy to sort of go down that rabbit hole and so um i think what my question is is um what are the buddhist hacks like my you know i can come out of contracted mind when i have like a regular sit um or a regular meditation um or if i go to a teaching which i do very frequently but when i'm like in my regular day-to-day -day life, it's harder to realize that I'm in contracted mind. So I think I'd like need some way of like, you know, it's like, do I need to put neon flashing signs in my apartment? I mean, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm looking for hacks. So how do you know? That. How do you know when? So so you can you've just described like more spacious awareness that happens in some guided meditations and in some, during some teachings, that's different to how it is in your daily life. So how do you know that? How do you know the experience of the contracted mind? What is it like? Oh, it's a you know feeling of tightness, or um, it can be like a mental state, like a judgment sense of judgment um anger ill will towards someone um and in the past one of the ways that i've i've managed that is to find some distraction um it's usually a buddhist distraction uh, like i'll turn on a dharma talk or mm -hmm. something like that to well, sort of awesome. get my mind out of that state mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah, so it's, it's you know, so there's like the, the contraction, the, the sense of tightness. So that's that's very good key. So it's like, oh, it's just, mind's tight. Tight mind is dukkha, you know, it's unpleasant. It's not, doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't benefit you or anyone else and it's unpleasant. So it's like, okay, when you add all that up and then there's some motivation to see if you can shift out of that. So if you can, um, invite so so first of all is, is you have to recognize what's going on and then to just relax like have a sense of i don't mean relax but like have a sense of just intentionally relaxing around the mind whether the mind is here or here just have a sense of oh can i just let that open up a bit and, and relax a bit 
and um, a, a sense of uh, spaciousness is really helpful. So even as we sit here now, you know, there's space around you, there's space around me, you know, there's the space around the head. So the head's all tight and contracted with, with thoughts. And then you can recognize other oh, space around the head. Can I open up a little bit, make some more room so that it's not so, so contracted? Can I relax that contraction a bit? And then with the thoughts, you know, like knowing this is ill will, this is the hindrance of ill will. This is resentment, you know, this is that goes under the category of ill will, you know, maybe fear that goes under ill will, anger, you know, and just so, so recognizing those, those are all under the hindrance of ill will and hindrance is a hindrance to awakening. So it's, you know, to know it is already a good start. And then what you're doing is skillful, you're, then you're, you're filling your mind with something wholesome. That's one of the things that the Buddha recommended, actually. You can also just like know this is this is ill will. You know, can I? So you could see. You know, can you? So what you're doing is you're changing the story by listening to something wholesome. And you could also experiment with can you change the story by actually putting a different story in there that doesn't have that same same agenda and same ending and a different story. That's another way of doing it. And so it's so it's noticing what's wholesome and what's unwholesome and feeding what is wholesome. So it's like the four right efforts, you know, the, the effort to not stir up the unwholesome that hasn't arisen yet and the effort to let go or remove, abandon the unwholesome that has arisen. So that's right effort. And then to, the effort to arouse the wholesome and to maintain that wholesome once it's arisen, that's right effort. So that's aligned with the path. And when we're just following the old habits of um, feeding the unwholesome, you know, it's it's can feel very justified, and you know, so it all lines up with a sense of self actually, but it doesn't lead us anywhere beneficial. So it's practicing right effort. Those four right efforts. Is there a sutta you would recommend? You know, I'm not so great with the suttas myself. I can never sort of come up with a on the on the moment. So, but you can, you know, if you if you have the the books, you know, if you have Bhikkhu Bodhi's books, you, or if you use the, go online, Bhante Sajatos or Tanisra, because then you could just look in the four right efforts. And then there's um, the remo re removal of distracting thoughts is also a very good one. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Removal of distracting thoughts. I think it's called removal of distracting thoughts or two kind of thoughts. Something. Okay, thank you. Victoria. Sorry, we're going a little over time. Thank you. It's okay if we go over time? Oh, I oh. mean, we haven't been stopped yet, so let's keep going. Okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I really um, have been struggling with the, with the, body mind conflict and so in in the spaciousness um i feel like my mind has an infinite capacity for spaciousness and the meditation about the light um actually like what what um was it bridget who said that the the sense of just like this incredible expanding light and um but my body is like this sort of big lump of flesh that <laughs> maybe it's because I'm 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 ill right now so it's exaggerated and just it's it's just been a battle the last few days even to sort of function so um you know maybe if if you led this meditation a week ago I <laughs> wouldn't be asking this question now but it's that sense of um when um I remember that in the talk one of one of Ajahn Chah's Dharma talks or I think I'm not sure, but I think um, he said something about how the the Buddha said that um, if our body is imprisoned, we should make sure our mind isn't imprisoned along with it. And so I was just wondering if you could um, give me some encouragement along that score, because sometimes I feel like I can, um, well, it's kind of also like Rumi's guest house in the sense that I I don't really want to be in charge of the guest house. Like I <laughs> 
I'd rather be visiting somebody else's guest house. I, I just feel this kind of burden of, I feel like, um, I mean, I don't know, that's like a mixed metaphor, but the, I have this sense that my body is kind of weighing me down and um, and I, I want to be respectful of it. And, you know, while I have it, you know, look after it, but, but I have this a kind of maybe almost resentment sometimes that like today, you know, I, I, my mind and my soul and everything felt spacious. My heart felt spacious. I felt this sense of expanding light. And then my body just felt like this, this, you know, unresponsive lump that was kind of like a ball and chain. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so I, anyway, I'd appreciate what you, whatever you can do to help me in my predicament. <laughs> it's, um, you know, the Buddha spoke so highly of um, having a human body that that this this human life is is the most precious of all of the different realms we could be born into of all the beautiful deva realms the realms of light the realms of um you know there's there's realms that are just like radiant light there's no there's no body there's no gender there's no anything you know there's just radiant light and bliss and you know knowing all of those realms the buddha says human realm is the best realm to be born in. So this is really, really important. And uh, we may want to get away from the body because it is coarse, you know, it's an animal body. It's, you know, it needs constant maintenance. It, uh, you know, it makes, you know, it's not, it doesn't always behave the way we want it to behave. It does what it does. And and, um, so the mind often has this story of, of greater refinement and uh, and sort of is a bit distasteful about the body looks down on the body so i had this very strongly when i first started to practice i mean before i practiced i mean i've had it for years and then when i started practicing i I started to see it oh there's this and the mind is really fed up with you know i really don't like and there's also this tendency to identify with the mind and not with the body it's like the mind is me and the body's this thing and this ball and chain so I mean, this isn't Buddhism exactly, but the, what I found really helpful, which I've which I've told many, many people, was to do this letter writing exercise. So to do this, you need two seats opposite each other, whether they're chairs or zafus, whatever, just that they're the same kind of thing. And you and you and some paper and pen. And you sit in one chair and you write a letter. So you sit in the chair. So one chair is the chair of the of the body, of, of the mind. There's a chair of the mind and the chair of the body. So you sit in the chair of the mind and you write a letter to body opposite you, dear body. And you just see what mind wants to write. Take 15 minutes if you want. You know, just take some time. You write a letter and you do it, do it real, you know. And then oh, you could, I guess you could type it and send it if you want to do it by email, but I've always written it and then you and then you get up and you go and sit in the seat of body and you 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 deliver the letter to body seat and then you sit in body seat and you open it as the body reading that letter from the mind and you read it and you take it in as the body the body's listening to that message and then body writes back what it wants to say to mind and it delivers the letter to the seat of mind and then you move and it's essential that you actually move and you move onto the back onto the mind seat and you read that letter from the body. And uh, it's remarkably telling. So it may be, so when I did that many, many years ago, 20 something years ago, uh, I, very similar, I was in a very similar place to you. They're just like fed up with this heavy, uncom- you know, uncomfortable body that is having to drag around and do all these things. And, and what came was that the body was, very angry the body was very angry with the mind mind you know the mind was very very um it really thought it was better you know it was looking down on the body thinking it was better than and the body was really angry and it's like you know i i work so hard every day you know i'm doing all of these things i i digest the food you eat i do the work you tell me to do i you know keep the body well and if an illness comes I, I you know maintain it and the body's doing all of this it's like a it's kind of like a slave actually and it's interesting you said about a ball and chain because it, it it becomes a bit like a slave and master 
relationship. The mind is the master and the body is the slave. And this is not a good relationship to be having. So we want to get out of that awful paradigm into a, a mutually respectful relationship between body and mind. So I really encourage you to do that exercise and to do whatever work needs to be done. Because the body is a friend, actually. And so now I have this incredible gratitude and respect for this body. And the body has a lot of wisdom. The body has way more wisdom than the mind. And actually, <laughs> the body knows that it's just part of nature. It's, the body is very attuned to the Dhamma. And the mind gets into this me and mind story. So... That's fabulous. Well, I, I hope um, it's not too long before I can check up with you and see how, see how it goes. Um, but just one last thing, of course, this is a massive thing. Um, how, how does this fit with like with non-duality? Because that's I, there's a part of me that thinks, uh-oh, like, okay, this sounds like a fabulous exercise, but is this going to bifurcate me even more in some way? Like if I find out that my body's enraged, which is probably case um if 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 I'll, i don't know there's so much talk about non-duality and i just i feel the like didn't, the buddha didn't actually teach non-duality as such it's there's a more of a um it's a different lit tradition so um the buddha taught interdependence the the law of interdependence you know the 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 dependent origination so that's what he's teaching it's a, it's a way of understanding so there is there is body there is mind there are and you know part of mundane right view there is mother there is father you know it's like it's not that those are not they they're not they don't exist but they exist independence on everything else mm -hmm. so everything is dependent on everything else so everything is codependently is is interdependently arising all the time so the buddha's talking about that it's too big to go into now at the end of a already at late at the end of a session but the yeah, non-duality isn't really a Buddha, Buddhist teaching as such. It's a slightly different way of perceiving. But interdependence is it's it both acknowledges the arising of something, the presence of something, and the emptiness. And that's what I find very beautiful in the Buddhist teaching. So he's, you know, the 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 sen the presence of a sentient being, you know, here we are as humans, this is a reality. And that's why we have the precepts to to, re to relate to each other in a skillful way and to relate to ourselves in a skillful way. If there was no, if everything was empty, you wouldn't need precepts. You just do whatever you like. It's all re irrelevant. But there, there is there is this this sentient reality, this this conditioned reality, and then there is also emptiness. Ultimately, there is no. It's all process. So the Buddha's teaching recognizes both of those and it brings them together. I always think like brings them together like two palms of the hands. The two, they're different, but they belong together. Oh, that's so beautiful. I'm sorry this is the end, but I hope to see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, I'm sorry, a little bit running out of time there. No problem at all. Um, thank you so, so much, Ayanna. Um, just a beautiful... Um, class and beautiful teaching, beautiful meditation. <clears throat> I learned so much as I always do from you. So yeah, I'll just uh, put a couple of links in the chat and then I know you want to get close things out for us. So I think everyone here knows we are the San Francisco Dharma Collective and we're um, supported completely by donations um, as of course is are the uh, nuns, the local par nuns. And uh, as such, we appreciate anything you can donate today. And we also are, uh, the most important thing is that you're here and that the, the wheel is turning and the Dharma is flowing. And so if you're not able to donate today, that is, that is fine. We are just happy that you're here. And I'll just put another couple of links in here in case you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to be on our mailing list and also to give you a sense of what's coming up at the Dharma Collective and I'll mention one thing I think we talked yeah so there's a link here to our newsletter and also our YouTube channel where all the Aloka Vihara um, teachings are archived as well as other teachers and then our upcoming events and 
any of you who are in San Francisco, we're going to be having a very special event this coming Friday. We're, we're going to have an Indian music uh, concert in our space. I'm sorry for so those of you who are not here. We're not going to do it um, on, on Zoom because it's just very complicated to make things sound good over Zoom. But um, <laughs> if you're in, in the city or you know anyone who is, let them know. It's this Friday at 730. And then we have lots of other classes. So check out what we have. And, and uh, Ayana Dabudi, we there was a question before you came on about that you are going to continue uh, visiting the Dharma Collective even after the Aloka is dispersed, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes, it'll be it'll be a little bit um, less of a rhythm between myself and Ice and the Tutor because um, there'll be some time when I'm in the area in the in the there'll be some time when I'm away out of the country, sometime when I'm in the Bay Area, and then sometime when I'm off in Washington State. So when during the, when I'm away, I sense tutor will be in person. So we, we're trying to do it in person as much as possible with the SFDC. So I sense tutor is now just up the road at um, San Rafael. She's already moved there now. She's so already. she will be coming in person. And then when I'm in the area, I will also be coming in person. And then until then, we'll be carrying on like this, uh, sometimes online and sometimes in person. But yes, we tend to carry on with, uh, with the... This is grateful. And and will the the sort of seasonal rhythm continue of the rainy day retreats and not, or is it gonna is that gonna it will be a little bit different? Yeah, it'll be a little bit different this year. So usually we, we're next year rather, usually we wouldn't come during the our winter retreat and we would come the rest of the time. So we're not actually having a winter retreat this time. We're doing things a little differently. So our our institute will be will be there in person during the, the next during those first months of the year. Okay. It will be a little bit longer than usual. I'll check in with, with her and you and we'll we'll make sure the schedule is updated. But yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. No, we appreciate what you're all doing. It's great. And so, and it's a beautiful space. If you haven't managed to get there, it's a beautiful space that's been that's been transformed into a meditation space. Lovely. Okay. All the best. Oh, a little chant. Just as the rivers flow into the sea, so what is given in generosity benefits the departed and all whom you love. Like the moon waxing full, shining brightly above, May all distress be averted, may all disease be destroyed, may no harm lie before you, and may long life bring you joy. Thank you all. Oh, this lovely dog too. Oh, okay, bye-bye.